Anyone remember Letterman's top 10? So I am going to reel off what I think are the top 10 <coughs> practical problems with censorship, silencing, and proactive policing of safe spaces. I am not going to delve into all of these individually. The point of just ticking them off is to notify you that all of these arguments are out there. Um, we can come back to some of them later if you're interested. And also because there are 10 of them, and a view which I can confidently defend is not a single one of these 10 arguments has ever been successfully addressed by the proponents of censorship, <coughs> safe spaces, and so on. So, number 10, majority rules. Censors enforced conformity, because in a majoritarian society, that's where the votes are, that's where the money is, that's where the popular sentiment is. Number nine, special interests dominate. Uh, you know this if you've ever been involved in campus activism. The authorities don't respond to the strongest claims. They respond to the strongest claimants, the most organized, focused, and vocal groups on campus who may represent themselves as speaking for a minority, uh, a majority, or for that matter, for oppressed minorities, but really are a faction speaking for themselves. Number eight, enforcement is inherently arbitrary, or it's inherently mechanical. Okay, wait, swastika, Hindu, Nazi, how do we decide? Is that offensive? Well, it doesn't offend me, maybe it offends you. Wait a minute, are we talking in the context of religion? Not really, what about, can we teach Huckleberry Finn? Anyone read Huckleberry Finn? So you all know the problem with that book, right? It's the greatest of all American novels. Um, well, it's in the top three. <laughs> Some of you may put Catcher in the Rye or Moby Dick ahead of it. Uh, can you teach that? Or is that hate speech? How do you make that ruling in a non-arbitrary way? There is not even in principle a bright line definition of the difference between hate speech and offensive speech. Number seven, the listener's veto, as they call it at the American Civil Liberties Union. When you put up rules saying that you have to have a safe space for everyone, that means the most easily offended person in the room, which in practice means the person who's quickest to claim to be offended, gets to decide what all the rest of us can hear. Um, that's not fair to all the rest of us. Number six, it's counterproductive. Martyring people with bad ideas does them a favor. It's, censor it's censorship showcases sociopaths. It gives them the court cases that gets them in front of the Supreme Court. It gets them attention. If your name is Milo Yiannopoulos and you have never had an original thought and you have never even had a profound thought, you can get famous by getting censored and by getting silenced and your speaking fees go through the roof. Now, I am not getting protested today at least not so far, maybe there are protesters in the room. Raise your hand if you're planning to do a silent protest, turn your back. I mean, we can get that out of the way now if we need to do it. Okay, no, one, no hands went up. So I keep thinking, would my speaking fees go up if I came out on the other side, if I trolled you all today? Um, by the same token, anti-PC backlash hurts the good guys. One of the major reasons <clears throat> without getting into politics, but clearly one of the major things that helped President Trump get elected was his political incorrectness. People don't like it when other people shut them up or tell them what they can and cannot say. It doesn't work. It makes the situation worse, and we're seeing that in American politics right now because you get the resentment and then you get the backlash. Um, number four, censorship is polarizing. It divides communities by elevating every dispute into this life or death struggle over who can say what and under what circumstances. And it creates an offendedness Olympics. It, it rewards people for saying, you know, I'm offended by what you just said. You need to apologize to me. You need to give me something. So you get these escalated sort of offendedness wars. We see that dynamic in campuses. Uh, number three, candid discourse is chill. This one is depressing to me, but I've had students often tell me 
that they just cannot have a candid conversation about uh, race or affirmative action or gender on campus. I've had graduates, recent graduates, for example, Harvard and Princeton. These are outspoken, extremely smart young people who said to me, this is a subject as outspoken as they are. They just will not open their mouths. And I said, why? And they said, because it's all downside. That's what's known as the chilling effect. Any rule you put out there will be observed by the people who are not sociopathic, who are going to be careful. It will be flouted by the people who are sociopathic and want to get famous. Number two, the investigation is the punishment. Never forget this. People will sometimes say, well, you know, we have a speech code, but you know, at the end of the day, it comes out OK. Never forget that if you're a faculty member, or for that matter, if you're a student, the very fact of being investigated for months at a stretch, worrying about your job, worrying about whether you're going to be disciplined, whether you're going to get a letter in your record, and so on, this is harrowing. And that's where the chilling comes from. Even if there's no ultimate sanction, the, the investigation is the sanction. And number one, at the top of everyone's list, the problem that no one has come close to dealing with, authoritarian control. Um, one of the reasons that speech codes and censorship and silencing get support is that people tend to imagine they themselves are doing the silencing. Well, if you're a progressive, imagine that you have speech codes and Donald Trump is deciding what you have to say. That's the thought experiment you have to run. Or if you're a conservative, imagine that Nancy Pelosi is the person deciding who you get, what you get to say. And if you're a student on campus and you're thinking about having a hate speech code, don't imagine yourself deciding what's hate speech. <coughs> Take the person on campus you disagree with the most and assume that that person will be deciding what's hate speech because they probably will. If we don't trust the authorities to look in our iPhones, why would we trust them to tell us what we can say and what we can hear? I submit no one has come up with an answer to any one of those 10, much less all of them. And that for all of those reasons, censorship and speech codes and silencing empower the powerful and organized. They chill the unpopular and marginalized. They operate randomly and unfairly. They benefit sociopaths. And they nurture authoritarianism. Other than that, they're fine.